This week on KUJH, learn how redistricting affects Lawrence residents. And hear what Bill Self and the players had to say about their win over K-State last night. Welcome to KUJH. I'm Olivia Acri. And I'm Johan Marin. Many cities in Kansas may soon belong to a different district, as the Kansas legislature overturned Governor Laura Kelly's veto on the proposed state congressional district map. The Kansas Senate is working on a map to redraw the four existing congressional districts. Cities like Lawrence, Eudora, and Baldwin City could not be split up. Many northeastern Kansas residents are upset with the map, which moved Douglas County out of the second district and into the first. On how we slice up northeast Kansas, we're putting all the focus on Wyandotte, Lawrence, and pulling them into all these other districts. This move takes Lawrence, which is considered a Democratic stronghold, to a rural, more conservative part of the state. And the one thing that never changes on these maps is the magic halo of Wichita. But somehow, Northeast Kansas is required to slice and dice, and we have to make all these machinations. The House and Senate overrode Kelly's veto on February 9th, which enacted the redistricted map across the state. A plethora of phone call scammers are starting to pose as law enforcement officers, and it's leaving many city officials concerned. It's gotten a lot worse, um, and they're actually now using um, legitimate uh, staff names. For many, a phone call from a law enforcement officer can be concerning, but it's even more concerning when that phone call is actually from a scammer. Douglas County Under Sheriff Stacy Simmons says scam calls in Lawrence have been a recurrent concern. Usually daily that somebody calls in and says that uh, either somebody is calling them or they need to report, um, take a report because they've been scammed uh, or they just have questions about um, scamming in general. In the United States, calls verified as scams make up 4.8% of phone spam. Simmons says that these verified scam calls pose as familiar phone numbers for people to answer. They use um, spoofing numbers, and so what that is, um, it's actually illegal. Uh, they make it so that somebody um, maybe recognizes a phone number or it comes up um, as something they recognize from that area code, and so people will answer it, um, and it'll say, you know, like Douglas County Sheriff's Office on it or, or Police Department. For residents that do pick up a scam call, Simmons says city officials will never ask Lawrence residents for money. And they're asking for iTunes gift cards or asking for cash. Um, and it's, it's like I said, it's different amounts up to $8,000, um, a couple hundred dollars. City officials advise Lawrence residents not to pick up their phones unless they expect a call from law enforcement. If you or someone else are unsure whether you have been scammed through the phone, make sure to call your local sheriff's office. According to a report from Inside Higher Education, faculty at the University of Kansas is determined to stop the elimination of 42 academic programs. The KU Senate agreed to cut 28 of the proposed program eliminations, but those programs are mainly in inactive and won't affect students. However, faculty members have argued the other 14 are too important to cut. Some of those programs include humanities, Latin American and Caribbean studies, and visual art education. KUJH's Sam Lance talked to one of KU's visual art education faculty members, Liz Kovalchuk. She said over email KU will not be cutting the program. Instead, the program will transition into a BFA in the visual art department and will be a new track. The Vice Provost's office accepted the proposal two weeks ago, and now Kovalchuk hopes the changes can be up and running by May so the school doesn't lose enrollment. Kovalchuk is one of several faculty still fighting for their programs. Now let's take a look at how this transition is affecting professors and students in the program. Reporter Alyssa Wingo tells us more about this new transition. As the Faculty Senate held hearings to decide which programs to cut last fall, the Visual Arts Education program was headed towards discontinuance. Due to large amounts of support, the Senate voted to continue the program, which teaches students how to become art teachers. However, Professor Liz Langdon says the Provost had other plans for their program. While students will no longer be able to major in Visual Arts Education, they will be able to obtain a Bachelor's in Fine Arts with an emphasis on it instead. It's a little bit different. Their um, arts education may not be quite as broad. Many supporters of the program showed up to the hearing to speak on the importance of arts education, which was why the Faculty Senate voted to keep the program at KU. We got letters of support 
and local art educators that have been in the field and know how important it is and who really appreciate the education they got here, um, they were very verbal and spoke up. However, even with the outpour of support and a vote to keep the program, the university administration decided to change it to an emphasis in the fine arts degree, which is not what Langdon or her colleagues were expecting. It was a unanimous vote to support our program, which we thought was going to be the end of it. Langdon says offering arts education at KU is so important for the future generation of both students and teachers in the field. She hopes KU will show more support for the arts in the future as her program transitions. Regional art teachers and we have a amazing art department that supports it. So to take out that key element does not make sense. Reporting for KUJH, I'm Alyssa Wingo. Thank you, Alyssa. After confusion about the program's continuance last semester, it wants students to know that the visual arts program will still be offering classes this spring and into the next academic school year. Well, earlier this week, we saw a little bit of snow, but it was nothing like we saw last week. Now, let's send it over to Halen Wilhite. Halen, what can you tell us about the weather and what it will look like in the next few hours? Well, it's certainly been a wild week of weather here at KU. We saw temperatures getting up to, well, we had that winter storm last week that gave us about seven to eight inches here at KU. Then we saw temperatures getting up into those 70s on Monday and then just plummeting once we got into Tuesday. And it's been so bitterly cold out here. When you're out here, the, the cold is just nipping at your face. Temperatures only been getting into those 20s. But good news is that looking ahead this weekend and going into next week, we are gonna be seeing some relief although still got to hold on to those cold temperatures for the next 24 to 48 hours and going to be tracking a little bit of some snow going ahead for tomorrow. But just sit on tight there. We've got that warm weather on the way. Back to you in the studio. Thanks, Helen. I know I'm done with the cold weather. Are you? Oh, me too. <laughs> Coming up next on KUJH, what is Student Senate doing to improve accessibility on campus? Stay tuned to find out. Welcome back to KUJH. Accessibility on campus for disabled students is a big concern for Student Senate. Elise Noe tells us how Student Senate is handling this concern. The Student Senate is looking to create new policies that KU can implement to make the campus more accessible for those with disabilities. This is like accessibility is one of the big things that like we have to like fight for because it's something that people don't really want to think about because we're on a very old campus. So we have issues like a lot of the older buildings aren't necessarily chair accessible. Around campus, many students with disabilities struggle with finding a way to safely get to class. The steep hills on campus being one of the biggest obstacles. So one of the things that we are discussing is the hot I think it's called the hawk route um, notorious for being just horrible <laughs> the hawk route was created to help students get from Jayhawk Boulevard to Sunnyside Avenue the hawk route maps out a long and winding path where students with accessibility issues are expected to navigate their way through accessible doors and elevators through multiple buildings like Beauty Hall Anschutz Library Mallet Hall and Hayworth Hall until finding their way to the Dole Human Development Center. For most students with accessibility issues, it takes over an hour to get from Sunnyside Avenue to Jayhawk Boulevard, a journey that would take an able-bodied student under 10 minutes to make. We have been wanting to expand the like capacity of Safe Ride. Looking into is making that kind of a 24 seven deal. So obviously that means taking money from other places. Chavaria says that financial support from KU administration is hard to obtain, but hopes that the university will see the need for new means of transportation for disabled students. Like, hopefully this is how people can, I guess, just get to classes 
in a way that doesn't involve the hawk route. Um, it's really like policies or specific ideas. It's a matter of like, we already know the issues that exist. This is Elise Snowy reporting for KUJH News. Thank you, Elise. For more information on KU's current accessibility policy, visit accessibility.ku.edu. And to keep up to date with Student Senate, visit studentsenate.ku.edu for more information. The professional selling program started at the business school in 2016 with only 14 members and now has grown to over 250 members. Anna Dennison has more on the program. The professional selling program at KU prepares students for successful careers in consultative selling. The program is offered through the business school, but welcomes members of all majors. The certificate of professional selling is a opportunity to layer a certificate on top of a major or a minor that you already have in existence. And so um, once you decide to pursue the certificate, what makes it really special is there's a, there's a component of classroom work. To earn a professional selling certificate, students must take three specific courses and complete four experiential activities, such as a sales competition or a networking mixer. I joined because I wanted to go into sales post-graduation. So I, the program was a great step. I was excited to, you know, advance my knowledge of sales before I started like working as a sales rep. The program has corporate partners that help students with the experiential activities. I've been exposed to different companies and been able to connect with different individuals from the networking mixers and mock interviews and I actually have my internship now from a mock interview that I did through the professional selling program. Helling says the program can be extremely helpful to students entering the workforce. I think it helps immensely. Um, regardless of what career you go into, you are always going to be selling. For KUJH, this has been Anna Dennison. Contact the Professional Selling Program Director, Kristen Helling, for more information on the program. Coming up after the break, Halen Wilhite tells us what to expect for this week's weather. Stay tuned. From adversity, we rose. We made history and became pioneers, voyagers, champions, jaywalks. And when our chant rises, Haunting and hallowed. Jayhawks are telling the world what's near. Victory. Welcome back and good evening, Jayhawks. It is a bitterly cold day out there and going to be still dealing with some of those colder temperatures for tonight and even going into tomorrow. Still looking at the possibility of some light snow accumulations going ahead of tomorrow. But good news is that still looking at becoming a lot more warmer this week. But for let's focus on right now. So far, we're starting to see uh, mostly clear skies out there. Starting to see a little bit of some clearing out there, although those clearing skies are not going to last as we're going to be watching for some more uh, skies, at least some more clouds moving in the area actually so this is a little bit of something that happened yesterday um, something interesting happened we've got lake effect snow that happened in Kansas currently at Tuttle Creek Lake and Melvern Lake you can clearly see those snow bands there all ahead we, with those temperature drops we had temperatures getting into those 70s on Monday and so those lakes were a lot more on the warmer side and so that colder air left for some um, a little bit of some of that lake effect snow there but just some interesting stuff there but not so interesting temperatures at the moment it is still bitterly cold out there currently 18 degrees across most of our viewing area although 16 degrees in the Kansas City metro area but winds are still a little bit on the a uh, little bit of the windier side blowing at about about 13 to 15 miles per hour in uh, at KU at the moment so with that wind got that nasty wind chill out there feeling like five degrees currently in uh, Lawrence right now but feeling like six degrees in Ottawa feeling like four degrees in Kansas City very bitterly cold and dangerous wind chills out there and we'll continue to deal with those dangerous dangerous wind chills going into tonight but so far very cold temperatures are still settling in across the region we're 
see in East still 18 degrees in Lawrence, 19 degrees in Wichita, 6 degrees in North Platte, Nebraska, and 14 degrees down in Springfield, Missouri. And currently down in the Ozarks, still dealing with quite that winter storm and ice storm down there. But so far, we're still relatively dry at the moment. But as I'm sure going into tomorrow, maybe going to be seeing a little bit of some wider snow accumulations. But still dealing with those mostly clear skies, seeing those high cirrus clouds up in the sky. And so not going to be expecting any kind of precipitation for tonight. Most of the precipitation at the moment is seismic force still in the Ozarks where they're still dealing with that winter and ice storm at the moment. But we'll continue to see those clouds starting to increase throughout the evening hours and temperatures slowly but surely still staying at least in those 20s, but eventually going to be bottoming out at least into those mid to lower teens. 14 degrees as our low, low for tonight, but of course, wind chill values still feeling in those single digits. So definitely if you're going to be out by tomorrow morning and going to those early 7 a.m. classes, you want to layer up as that weather or at least that cold air is going to be just brutal out there but also too much before it's going to be seeing a little bit of that snow kind of making its way a little bit starting maybe in those early morning hours and eventually just kind of staying around throughout the afternoon hours this is not a, a snow compared to last week rather it's going to be just more of a lighter snow so far accumulations are probably going to be at least between uh, an inch to half an inch possibly but still oh, but still dealing with those bitterly cold temperatures precipitation chance still at about 50% and those northeast winds blowing at about 5 to 10 miles per hour. But here's so far that uh, potential snowfall accumulation still dealing with those at least between a, uh, a half an inch to an inch of snow for tomorrow. But still looking ahead could be seeing some much milder weather ahead for us going into next week. Maybe seeing the return of those 60s going into next week. Much nicer weather is in store for us. So just hang in there Jayhawks and also be sure to stick around for some uh, of your latest updates in sports. Diversity. What is diversity? It can be an umbrella term for a variety of things, ranging from diversity among different people, places, cultures, and ideas, to the way people express themselves and the way they interact with the world. In today's world, people interact with one another and share their thoughts through social media. Let's take Twitter, for example. How are people of different backgrounds, ethnicities, and sexual orientations with different political beliefs, interests, and job titles using this platform differently? Currently, celebrities are interacting with their fans on Twitter by speaking their minds, sharing their beliefs, and supporting social issues. Professional sports figures and organizations in the United States are using Twitter to support social causes and bring attention to current social matters, such as encouraging their fans to vote. Users are voicing their opinions about current issues surrounding racial inequalities, social injustice, and police brutality in the United States. There's diversity in the way people are discussing the upcoming presidential election, especially regarding their opinions of each candidate. Different news outlets are not only highlighting stories in the U.S., but are talking about important stories from around the world. But many Twitter users don't post about controversial matters or social issues at all. Rather, they use their platform to create memes and post funny content for entertainment. While many topics going around this app involve social issues and political opinions, Twitter creates a space where people can pool together collections of diverse thoughts, comments, opinions, goals, and even a little humor too. So how can we use this platform to express our differences? More importantly, how can we use it to learn from each other's differences today? Welcome back to KUJH. Let's check in with sports director Andrew Lind, who tells us what Kansas coach Bill Self and players said last night after their 102-83 win over Kansas State. Well, last night, Bell, Bill Self was more than pleased with his team showing in the Sunflower Showdown. It was a combination of playing fast and a second-half surge. Here's what Coach Self had to say. We played pretty well offensively. I mean, that we were cooking there for a while. and and. Uh, you know, K-State played pretty well offensively, too. Uh, we couldn't stop them, and they couldn't stop us. Monday night's matchup began in familiar fashion as one team scored and then the other, going back and forth pretty much the entire first half. In the second, though, junior Christian Brown emerged with nine of the Jayhawks' first 14 points. I don't, I don't think any team in the country can play that fast with us. I mean, we're a good team in transition, so if teams want to play like that, um, you know, then we'll score 100 points. And a third of those points came from the bench, a point of emphasis that Coach Self has been harping on for some time now. Super senior Jalen Coleman Lands understands the assignment. He getting acclimated and, you know, playing with these guys and uh, just kind of finding my fit. Uh, it's getting better as I progress. Um, and it's just really just 
being consistent, having that opportunity and making the most out of it. But Self knows that this game isn't a good representation of what his team will face this weekend in Waco. You know, this is just one game and, and the Baylor game will not be like this game. Uh, uh, they're going to try to play fast, but it'll be more opportunistic playing fast. And, and we're not going to be able to go down there and, 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 and have this many possessions. Well, the Jayhawks took the court, approximately 4,000 students also took the seats by camping throughout the week. But the process of camping isn't as easy as shooting a free throw. Ryan Atchison shows us behind the scenes of how camping pieces together the atmosphere of what makes KU basketball so special. Whether it's shuffling cards, catching up on home, whether it's shuffling cards, catching up on homework, or even just relaxing for a bit, in order for thousands of students to fill Allen Fieldhouse. It starts here at camping, but you may not know that the people who make the camping experience happen are in a very similar situation. It's a lot of commitment. <laughs> we don't get really any perks from it. No volunteer experience. We're not paid. Just students. Junior Madeline Edmonds is the head of organizing hundreds of camping students at Jayhawk basketball games, but she doesn't do this just on her own. There's seven of us currently on leadership, so typically one of the seven can come down to the field house. Because being outnumbered is not an easy task. It would be a lot for one person, but thankfully there's you know, a lot of teamwork and a lot of people to kind of share the load. But for campers, sharing the load means sacrificing a little of their time. One week before every home game, the doors open bright and early. And after a lottery, groups of students will take turns holding their positions for the best possible spot at the game. It's been a pretty good experience so far. It's not that hard. Just We have a good group of people and we just have a good system so we make it work. While campers continue to keep a system that works, for Edmonds it's making the experience worthwhile. It's a lot of work but we we do it because we care and because you know we love basketball and we want to keep the tradition going. This has been Ryan Atchison reporting for KUJH News. KU men's basketball plays two more times in Allen Fieldhouse with games on March 1st against TCU and on March 5th against Texas. In other basketball news, the KU women are just one game behind number nine Iowa State in the Big 12 Conference standings. The Cyclones are tied with Baylor for first, but the Jayhawks have a chance to change that up in tonight's matchup. As women's basketball looks to extend its seven game win streak, the KU women's team is on a five game winning streak of their own. KU defeated number 16 Old Dominion 4-2 at Rock Chalk Park on Sunday. Head to our website at tv.ku.edu for a recap of Sunday's win. Now, let's send it back to Johan and Olivia. Thanks, Andrew. Camping is already underway for the upcoming game against TCU. Coming up, Elise Noe is going to give us some big news and entertainment. Stay tuned. Where you go to college makes a statement about you. This place will become a part of you, your identity for life. The University of Kansas, a great place to be you. Welcome back to KUJH. We send it over now to Elise Snowy with some national news in the world of entertainment. Elise, what's going on with these celebrity relationships? Thanks, Olivia and Johan. I'm Elise Noe, and I have your entertainment update. It looks like a lot of celebrity relationships are making headlines this week. Wedding bells are in Simone Biles' future. The four-time Olympic gold medalist got engaged to NFL player Jonathan Owens after being together for more than a year and a half. While love is in the air for some celebrities, the same can't be said for Aaron Rodgers and Shailene Woodley, as the pair ended their engagement this week. Rogers took to Instagram for some hashtag Monday Night Gratitude, where he thanked Woodley along with other people who made this past year special. And Britney Spears is getting ready to share her side of the story. The singer signed a $15 million book deal with publishing house Simon & Schuster for a tell-all memoir. The news of the book deal comes three months after a judge terminated Britney's 13-year-long conservatorship. The 73rd annual Rock Chalk Review event is showing this week at the Lead Center. This is the first time in over a year they are back performing in person. Reporter Mackenzie Laporte shares the story. 
Rock Chalk Review features five groups from the University of Kansas's Greek Life. These groups create their own original musicals to perform in front of a live audience. This production includes the five performing groups as well as the advisory board that handles all of the behind the scenes. Each person dedicates up to 25 hours per week up until show day. We are in charge of curating the five shows that all the Greek houses participate in, and uh, we work with the groups every day. We're there every day, five hours a day, sometimes more, working personally with these groups to make sure the shows are the best they can be. I don't think people realize the magnitude and the scale of this entire show, so it's, it's pretty um, breathtaking when you realize um, you know, how much effort it requires. Standing here today with the stage right behind me that the five groups from Rock Chalk Review will be performing on this Thursday with a live audience for the first time since 2020. These five groups have spent the past year writing, choreographing, and directing their own musicals to perform in front of a panel of judges. I think this the, what's really fun this year is that it, it's back in the lead center. Um, the theme for the show is for old time's sake, and we'd like to think that for old time's sake we're going to be back in the lead center. And, trying to hold rock chalk as, as it's always been. The show is hosted here at the Leeds Center and will be open to the public this Thursday, February 24th through the 26th. Now make sure you grab your mask because the Leeds Center is in accordance with KU's mask policy. Now we leave you today with the sights and sounds of Rock Chalk Review for 2022. Okay. Let's go. What's that? Not only do these students sing and dance, but they also raise money for a local charity every year. This year, they are partnered with the Willow Domestic Violence Center of Lawrence. Tickets are still available. Head over to lead.ku.edu for yours today. There you have it, your entertainment news for the week. Back to you, Olivia and Johan. Thanks, Elise. A lot of news this past week from Hollywood. Coming up on KUJH, we look at the most popular Girl Scout cookies here on campus. Stay tuned. Why doesn't my skin look like theirs? Why is my nose so big? I'm never gonna look like those girls. Welcome back to KUJH. It's that special time of year again. Girl Scout cookies have returned. Sarah McDonough went to the streets and asked Jayhawks which cookie they liked the most. Girl Scout cookie season is in full swing and I'm out here on the KU campus asking you what your favorite cookie is. Thin mints. Um, I love putting them in the freezer. I just really like the mint flavor and with the chocolate it's just like a perfect mix. I know some people just be trying to trash thin mints but my favorite they're the best <laughs> i like the caramel delights um i like the thin mints because like the minty and chocolate samoas because i like the caramel and then the coconut and then the chocolate like all the flavors at the same time you know mine's the peanut butter patties mine is the peanut butter patty also because i love peanut butter thin mints are definitely the way to go if you're looking for a girl scout cookie if i had to pick a girl scout cookie i would definitely go with peanut butter patties for kujh news i'm sarah mcdonough What's your favorite cookie, Johan? I would say mine would be Thin Mints. What about you? Mine's unpopular. Mine would be Lemonades. I would have to agree. <laughs> Thank you for watching KUJH. Tune in next week at 4 p.m. For more coverage, be sure to follow us on Instagram and, t and Twitter and to visit our website at tv.ku.edu. Have a good evening.